Welcome everyone to a new VNet webinar. My name is Yus Hernandez from Barcelona Chamber of Commerce and I will be the moderator of the current session. Today we have with us our Friends of You Japan Center who will share their expertise in the agri-food sector as well as economic partnership agreement between the European Union and Japan with all of us. However, before I give the floor to them, I would like to introduce very briefly what is the BNET project and explain to you the wonderful news that we have. BNET, Building European Export Networks, is a European Union funded pilot project which aims at supporting inter cooperation amongst European micro, small and medium enterprises that intend to enhance their presence in the international markets and seize the opportunities of an ever-changing economic scenario with different activities such as this webinar. A few weeks ago, we had the pleasure to present the 10 awarded European Business Network in an event that took place in the city of Barcelona. The 10 selected consortiums will be able to create synergies, implement actions, and achieve results according to joint interna internationalization strategies. Moreover, they will receive European Union financial support of 25,000 euros as a maximum in order to complete their action plans. So congratulations to all the companies that made it so far and the best of luck. To end this short introduction, I remind to all of you that if you, are, uh, that if you have any questions with the webinar, you can write it in the chat box at the end of the presentation and we will answer it. Now, I give the floor to our friends of the Japan Center. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, dear Luis, thanks very much for uh, this kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to take part in this BNET webinar today. Before the start of uh, our experts' presentations, I would like to take a couple of minutes and briefly present the support activities of the EU Japan Center. Uh, we're kind of a unique venture, uh, partially funded by the European Commission and partially funded by METI, Japanese Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. That is to say that uh, we're a non-profit uh, governmental organization and all of our support activities are free of charge. We have two offices, uh, headquartered in Tokyo and in Brussels. Uh, together, we try to promote all forms of uh, industrial cooperation between European and Japanese companies. Uh, for further information, um, I would like to mention today the two key websites uh, that we have in place. On the ujapan.eu uh, website, you can find all the information about our activities, including various seminars, matchmaking missions, webinars, trainings, and other similar information. On the EU Business in Japan website, you can find a bit more practical information on different sectors in Japan. We also have a vast library of market reports, uh, over 100 reports uh, written by our external and internal experts expert story covering all sectors in Japan, and we also organize several webinar series on a monthly basis. In addition, if you have any more specific detailed inquiries, you can also send us an email to info at the eujapan.eu and receive a little bit more personalized response within 48 hours. Other supporting activities include matchmaking missions uh, to Japan for companies working, as mentioned before, in biotech, nanotech, and ICT sectors, uh, various training programs in Japan and in the EU, cross-cultural and newly established expert support workshops with our YEN partners in all EU member states. Uh, we also lend our office facilities in Tokyo and have several help desks in place. Yet for more and uh, full information, do not hesitate to check our website on the link below, uh, eujapan.eu summary of activities, or contact me directly at ava at uh, eujapan.eu. And now, uh, without the further ado, I would like to present our first expert today, Mr. Ivan Vanesbeck. Uh, who will present potential benefits of the EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement in the food industry. Mr. Vanesbeck previously worked for the European Commission in the sector of uh, international agricultural trade negotiations. He is currently working as a consultant on issues related to the EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, Mr. Vanesbeck, uh, pleased to have you here with us today, and the floor is yours.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with you uh, in order to present uh, the opportunities that are contained in the EU-Japan EPA as regards uh, processed agricultural products, the PUPs as we call them. The uh, EPA agreement uh, has been negotiated for a uh, couple of years between uh, EU services and Japan. It has been signed uh, in July 2018, and it has entered into force now just about a little bit more than one year ago, on the 1st of February 2019. Um, it's an agreement for which uh, uh, offering enormous uh, opportunities for the EU agricultural sector. When one looks at statistics, 87% uh, of EU agricultural exports to Japan will enter duty-free over time. So that is an important part, uh, what we call the market access contained in the agreement. Another important uh, chapter in the agreement, and we will cover that as well in this presentation briefly, is the high level protection for uh, important EU geographical indications, the GIs as we call them. So a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this presentation. First of all, what the EPA is offering, the kind of concessions, some trade data, the market access block, very important, geographical indications, and also uh, a brief overview on rules of origin. Uh, as you know, it is a very complex uh, uh, sector in uh, the trade, the agricultural exports, and certainly also the processed agricultural uh, sector. We cannot cover everything in this presentation. So a last important point in this presentation are the information sources where you can further surf on the internet in order to obtain uh, much more detailed information as regards this sector. So a few highlights what the EPA is offering for the processed agricultural products. Let me first of all uh, just briefly explain uh, the different kinds of concessions. The first group of products are have been liberalized the duties, the import duties, I mean, in Japan, have been liberalized uh, fully at the entering into force uh, last year in uh, February. A second part of uh, concessions are those, those duties which are gradually reduced over time and become zero after uh, a period of time. We call that the phasing out of duties. Then there is a part of concessions that contain only duty reductions that can be immediately at, re -entering, at the entering into force or also spread over time, but there will always be a remaining reduced duty into force in the subsequent years. Then there is also, uh, these are the concessions contained within quantitative limits under TRQs, tariff rate quotas. That means that duties can be reduced or even phased out within a TRQ. That means if in a given year uh, a certain limit, the level of the TRQ is exceeded from that moment, the normal base rate applies until the end of the year. In the new year, we start again from uh, zero or reduced duty within uh, the quantitative limits. These are TRQs. And then there is a very small number of products that are excluded from any concessions. 
Uh, one important remark is that duties that have been eliminated uh, at the entry into force, those tariff lines do not appear in the agreement. So if you look on the basis of a tariff code for uh, the concession of a given product and you don't find it in the schedule of the agreement, that means that the duty has been phased out at the entry into force or that the duty at MFN level was already zero for all the WTO members, so erga omnes, before the entering into force of the agreement. So these tariff lines do not appear in the agreement. Let that be very clear. So now if we have a look uh, at a few highlights of the most exported EU processed agricultural products to Japan, important products such as mineral waters, egg albumin, cocoa powder, pectic substances, spirits, yeast, and uh, caseinates uh, have been liberalized at the entry into force of the agreement. Other important products such as uncooked spaghetti, esterified starches, food preparations, chocolate confectionery, candies and biscuits will be liberalized within five to ten years after the entering into force of the agreement. And then important TRQ levels uh, are provided for other products uh, mostly related to wheat and barley. When we have a brick, uh, quick look at the trade, just to know what we are talking about. Uh, when we are adding up the most important exported EU processed agricultural products to Japan, one comes to an overall value of almost 2 billion euros in 2017. So we speak about tobacco products uh, processed, prepared fruit and vegetables, uh, the uh, chocolates, the beers and the spirits, the casein and the pasta. So that is an important part of our total agricultural exports to Japan. So it is an important sector. So most of the important uh, processed products in value are tobacco products and followed, as already explained, the prepared fruit and vegetables, the beers, and the spirits. These are uh, 2017 uh, figures, but uh, there are already uh, indications, according to first statistics, uh, already indicate an important boost in our uh, agri-exports uh, to Japan since the entering into force of the agreement. So that is already a very favorable uh, indication that the entering into force of the agreement has already a positive impact uh, on our exports. A last overview of the main exports to Japan uh, over the years. Uh, important recovery of tobacco products in the last three years. Given that cigarettes have been liberalized at the entering into force of the agreement, further increase of these products in exports to Japan can be expected. Uh, other products liberalized from day one will for sure have boosted exports in the coming years, such as uh, spirits, egg, albumin, protein substances, and lactose, for instance. When we now go uh, into a little uh, further detail of market access opportunities that the EPA is offering to our exporters, we see that, as already said, cigarettes have been eliminated, duties have been eliminated at the entry to force of the agreement, and other tobacco products uh, have a duty, a duty phasing out over 10 years. Then uh, the prepared or preserved fruit and vegetables, uh, the sweet corn uh, 
liberalized at the entering into force or according to the tariff line duty phasing out in five years. Uh, mixtures of vegetables and peanut butter, for instance, uh, duty phasing out over five years and the processed potatoes duty phasing out in five to seven years. You will understand we can only highlight uh, a few examples because the list of uh, tariff lines is so long that it would be endless if we would cover them all. As regards uh, the beverages, uh, spirits had already, uh, Japan already offered zero duty at MFN level uh, for the grape distilled spirits such as cognac and armagnac and whiskies and fruit brandies. Those products had already zero duty at MFN level. Other spirits like uh, gin, vodka, and Geneva, uh, there as an EPA concession, there is now duty-free entrance since the entering into force of the agreement. Beers were already duty-free as well, and the uh, mineral waters and soft drinks duty-free from year one, and those containing added sugar there, there's a duty phasing out over five years. An important group of products are the chocolates and the cocoa. So for uh, confectionery products related to that liberalization in five to 10 years, food preparations containing cocoa for the preparations of chocolate, duty-free TRQ uh, with a quantity of 440 tons in year one, and that quantity is increasing over the years up to 1,300 tons in year 11. So as long as exports take place within that annual quantity, the duty is free. Other food preparations containing cocoa, uh, duty reduction within a TRQ with an uh, unchanged quantity of 580 tons, the base rate in that quota uh, of 21% will be gradually reduced to 10% in 2028 to remain at that level in the subsequent years. For the products, the albumin, the caseins, uh, dextrins, and modified uh, Starches, the most important uh, products, uh, as you can see, casein and caseinates, uh, duty-free at the entering into force of the agreement. Um, there is duty phasing out for the dextrins and the other modified starches and for the glues based on starches, duty-free as from 2028. Egg albumin also, as already said, duty-free at the entering into force of the agreement. For the sugar confectionery products, all the Chapter 17 uh, processed agriculture products uh, already have duty-free since uh, the entering into force of the agreement, except a few exceptions listed here, the maltose and the chewing gums and the candies and so on. There, there is a duty phasing out, a gradual duty phasing out over a period of 10 years. But in conclusion, all uh, the sugar confectionery products mm. will sooner or later become duty free. Most of them, for most of them, it is already the case. For uh, products and preparations based on cereals, as already highlighted, you have lots of TRQs for these products, like the mixes and those and cake mixes, where you have a TRQ of 14,000 tons uh, at the end of the period. Uh, it is a little bit lower now. The food preparations uh, uh, made preliminary of wheat, you have a TRQ of t uh, 3,000 tons in 2023 all duty-free within the quota, also for the food preparations containing more than 50% sucrose, 
there uh, you have duties gradually reduced by 50%. It's not duty free within the quota. It is a duty reduction only. And for the biscuits, the cookies, and so on, as you see on top, there you have a gradual duty elimination between five to 10 years. A last table on market access, you have, of course, many, many other products, uh, a few of them, the yogurt duty phasing out over 10 years, the dairy spread, that's within uh, duty reduction within a TRQ, and so on, uh, the yeast uh, duty-free, the sauces, the mustard, mayonnaise, duty-free already, uh, extracts and concentrates of coffee, duty-free as well, uh, duty reduction uh, for the ice cream, and so on, and so on. Uh, I will, in the information sources, I, I know you would stay with lots of questions for specific products. I will try to reply uh, on that at the end. Uh, otherwise, in the information sources, you will see the website uh, of two important websites. First of all, of the agreement itself, where you find all the concessions, and also uh, the tariffs uh, in the Japanese customs website, where you would find the confirmation, the same information uh, for our exports of all these products to Japan. Uh, this concludes the chapter on market access. We now briefly explain uh, geographical indications. Statistics indicate, in general, that products with a protected name have much more export opportunities than products without protected name. So therefore, we hammered during the negotiations very much that uh, we insisted that Japan should agree on a direct protection of EU GIs, a certain number of EU GIs under the EPA. Uh, because we believe that it is important, uh, whether it is exported by big companies or by SMEs, products with protected names have a huge advantage uh, to other products. What does it contain, this uh, protection of GIs? First of all, direct protection. Direct protection means it is contained, it is binding within the agreement. So Japan, under the terms of the agreement, is legally uh, obliged to protect these names, which are also listed in the agreement. So therefore, for these names, there is no need for individual claims or so on. Now It is done in the framework of the agreement. That is very important. An important point is also the relationship between these GIs and trademarks. If a GI is protected in the agreement and there is a subsequent request in Japan for a trademark with, in Japan with the same name, that will be refused and where there is already an existing trademark in Japan, existing before the entering into force of the agreement, there there will be coexistence with the relevant and the corresponding GI. Prior use uh, will expire between five and seven years. And of course, an important point, there is the possibility legally also in the agreement uh, to add, in the future, new GIs to be protected in Japan. An important uh, issue also are the rules of the party. We are not here in this context enter into details. There are uh, Website, there are websites where you can find further information. The Center, the EU Japan Center, has already organized a webinar on the rules of origin. It should be, uh, it has been recorded as well as this webinar uh, on the website of the EU Japan Center. So you will get much more information uh, using these sources. Here, for those who are not familiar with uh, rules of origin. There are a few definitions which are very important to understand. Um, you have, first of all, the, the coding of the products. 
you have a code at two digits, at four digits, six digits, and even more. At two digits, it is called a chapter a heading at four digits, and a subheading at six digits. That is the international recognized structure of the harmonized system tariff classification codes. Uh, each country goes deeper into details. Japan codes go up to nine digits. <coughs> The rules of origin a product in order to obtain concession, that's why it's so important, in order to obtain concession under the EPA, the product must comply with the relevant rule of origin. And these rules per product group are contained, I will explain later in the, in the sources where you can find it in the agreement, but in the agreement, apart from the general rules, you have specific rules, uh, the product specific rules, you see it in the yellow box, the PSR, where you find per product group, it can be at heading level for digit or subheading level or chapter level, you have the clear definitions and the conditions of the specific uh, rules of origin for that product. So if you want to export uh, products, whether it is agriculture or other textiles and so, check first the product specific rule in the agreement to see whether you can comply. Because if you produce a product in the EU, there are rules. Uh, as regards non-EU Japan materials used in that uh, production process. And you have rules which allow change of chapter, change of tariff heading, and change of uh, subheading. So when you have a change of chapter, uh, and you are producing a processed agricultural product using several materials, you can use when there is the indication in the PSR that for that product it is change of chapter, then you can use non-EU Japan originating materials in the production of that product if these materials are classified under another chapter. And that is very important to know. And the same for heading and the same for subheadings. So a few examples which might explain it a little bit better for those who are not familiar with rules of origin. When we look, for instance, at yogurt, buttermilk, dairy spreads, so those contained in the uh, codes 0401 to 0410, there uh, all the materials uh, from used in that production, which are classified under chapter 04, must be wholly obtained, i.e. must be of EU or Japan origin. There is a typing error in this slide. It must be of EU and Japan origin. You have that in the four, in the three uh, rows lower, it's the same mistake. Uh, so it should be EU and Japan originating or origin. So if you are producing yogurt and you import chapter 04 materials from a non-EU member state and also not from Japan, then you are violating the rule wholly obtained. That means if you import other chapter 04 products for the production of your yogurt, from another a non-EU country, you will not get the preference in the, under the EPA. For extracts, uh, concentrates of coffee and tea, for instance, 2101, there the rule is change of chapter. So EU, non-EU or Japan originating products are authorized there, uh, or materials are authorized in the production of these 2101 products if these products, which are non-EU origin or Japan origin, are classified under another chapter. 
be careful also, read carefully the PSR rules because certain technical conditions or other conditions may apply. And the same for bread, there is CTH or it can be a change of tariff heading or for the products 30, 130220, the pectic substances and so on, there it is change of tariff subheading. If you use non-EU or Japan originating products, then these products can uh, be imported if they are classified under another subheading. So here we come now, uh, we arrived at the end of the presentation, uh, information sources. There you have, first of all, the website where you find the EPA text and the annexes. The text is important, the annexes are also very important. Annex 2A, you find the schedule and the notes. Uh, the notes explain in detail uh, the concessions among which the TRQs, for instance. Again, if a product, a tariff line is not listed in that schedule, that means that the duty is zero under the agreement or already was duty, uh, was free before the entry into force of the agreement. Annex 3B explains the specific rules of origin as explained. And in Annex 14B, you find the list of the protected GIs. The uh, EU-Japan Center Help Desk, EPA Help Desk, has already published lots of fact sheets as well as recorded uh, webinars, wines and spirit GIs, dairy, meat, processed agricultural products, has already been presented. Uh, I think these are also important sources of information. Uh, where you find uh, import procedures in Japan, uh, as it is customs or whatever, the tariffs, uh, another important information is the market access database uh, put on the web by the European Commission, by DigiTrade, and a handbook published also by DigiAgri, which is the food and beverage handbook lots of information about opportunities in Japanese markets, uh, import procedures, and so on. Where you, find, where you can find detailed information as regards also the custom procedures, there also you have in English uh, an important Japanese uh, website. Further websites of DigiTechSuit on rules of origin, uh, of the Commission also on geographical indications, the procedures, and so to uh, uh, register a GI and what it means, the importances, and so on. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will try to reply to your questions. Uh, if it's not possible at this stage, I will take note of your question, and I will consult experts then uh, in the European Commission and we will reply in writing. But again, I will do the utmost to reply straight in this, uh, straight away in this session. Thank you very much again for your attention. Mr. Van Esbeck, thank you very much for your thorough and insightful presentation. Very much appreciated. I just wanted to mention to all participants that indeed we will address all the questions in the chat box shortly after our second expert uh, presentation. So without the further ado, our second speaker today is uh, Professor Chieko Nakabayashi, who will discuss key points to keep in mind when exporting luxury food to Japan. Nakabayashi worked uh, for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in Rome and the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in Vienna. She is currently a professor and consultant in business development in Brussels and Tokyo. Um, Ms. Nakabayashi, pleased to have you as our expert today, and please go ahead. The floor is yours. Webinar, I would like to present Japanese food market. 
Um, the European Commission just announced the um, the result of export uh, food exports to Japan under the EU Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, export of EU agri food products to Japan increased dramatically in the last one year. Uh, for instance, the frozen meat uh, sold 221% more, milk and cream 121% more, tea 40% more, sunflower seeds 40% more, and so on. So uh, today, we will, uh, will be discussing nine topics, uh, as you see on the screen. Uh, we focus on how to successfully export EU premium luxury food products to Japan. Uh, one, uh, we will discuss size and the characteristic, uh, characteristics of Japanese food market. Two, consumer behavior. Three, market for premium food and price discrimination. Four, growing markets. Five, distribution channels. Six, engineering and redesigning EU food products. Seven, challenges and opportunities. Eight, competitions and then collaboration. Nine, uh, references to the previous webinars for more information. So let's start with the first topic size and the characteristics of uh, Japanese food market. Japan is 127 million consumer market, uh, which is equivalent to a quarter of EU's 512 million consumers. Japan's food market is large and mature, and the product life cycle is short. Food spending is the largest expenditure for Japanese household. About a quarter of Japanese disposable income goes to food and drinks. Japan's agriculture sector is very small, and two-thirds of the food needs in Japan are met by import. The EU is the second largest food supplier to Japan after the United States. Two, uh, topic two, uh, we discussed about consumer behavior. Japan import more than ever fruits, vegetable, meat, and the milk and dairy products. And 50% of the imports are processed food. As consumer preferences are converging to the one of Europeans, Japanese consumers buy more European products than ever for their daily lives. Japanese perceive European food products very authentic and safe. However, according to the recent EU study, Japanese consumers do not perceive EU food products uh, so well in terms of quality and health and variety. So in order to enter the Japanese premium food, uh, food market, uh, therefore EU companies need to promote quality of products and a raise price to the expected level of quality because uh, EU companies cannot simply apply the same price variations as, as they do at home. As food market become mature, market demands can shift very quickly. This brings the product life cycle shorter and shorter in Japan. Food prices have been increasing since 2013 and uh, consumption tax for eating out and uh, catering services went up uh, from 8 to 10% in 2019. On the contrary, people's lifestyle changed, people's demographic trend changed, and the people's value system for personal spending changed uh, to spend even more on food and drinks. Japanese consumers now want to actively spend money on dining out, eating expensive food, and trying out well-known restaurants as part of leisure activities. Japan's food market is quality-oriented, 
and the consumers pay the price for quality. In Japan's food market, there are three ways to win consumer trust and loyalty on quality. One, authorities guarantee quality. Two, tradition proves quality. And three, labels ensure quality of products. Then uh, they are issued with uh, one certification, two traditional production method, and three with product levels. These three factors ensure the accountability and authenticity and the transparency of products to the Japanese customers. Uh, topic three, market for the premium food and the price discriminations. Japanese consumers believe that the quality product reflects on price. Japanese value quality and pay the price. This creates a unique uh, market segment for premium, super premium food products. Good example is a domestic apples. There are 127 Japanese apples officially registered. Top quality Japanese apple, Esashi, for instance, charge 290 euros per apple, only one apple. But the farms harvest only 1% of total yield productions to sell only the best. In Japan, food quality is related to rareness and genuineness and seasonality of products. Japanese consumers tend to pay products higher, which are not so aban abundant, not so many available. On the screen, I show you a premium uh, imported food in the Japanese market. Some examples. Uh, some examples from the EU. Uh, you see uh, Oreo Mire. It, it is old uh, Fargus Spanish uh, extra virgin oil. 500 milliliters for uh, 185 euros. You also see uh, white truffles from Italy. Uh, this costs 100 grams for 700 euros. Uh, on your right the bottom, age the balsamico with DOP. This costs 100 milliliters for 200 euros. Uh, on your uh, left upper side, Hamon Iberico Real Bejota. One cost for 4,000 euros. Uh, next is the Verona Luxury Black Chocolate and the Black Truffles from the French uh, Perigot called the Black Diamond. Uh, this one piece of chocolate costs 220 euros. These products, they all succeeded to brand their product with authenticity, accountability, and then transparency. And they charge premium prices for Japanese market. EU companies uh, entering uh, the, uh, the premium food market in Japan uh, needs to study consumer preferences and then discriminate the prices suitable to the Japanese market. We move to the next topic, growing markets. Uh, packaged food. Packaged food is the one uh, made available ready to eat without any preparation. It is portable and it have a long shelf life. Japanese packaged food market is large, the third largest in the world, but it's highly competitive and fragmented. It is anybody's market. The combined market share of top Jap uh, five Japanese brands, like uh, Meiji Holdings and uh, Yamazaki Baking, they only take only 12% of the total market shares. Even none of the top five global packaged food companies, like uh, Nestle, PepsiCo, Mondelez, Unilever, and Danone, are unable to crack Japanese domestic market. So um, smaller sized EU companies have a very good chance, very good opportunity to enter the Japanese packaged food market. As for value-added packaged food, market for functional food is expanding. 
functional food include energy drinks, nutri uh, nutritional dense snack bars, and prepared snacks or cereals with dried fruits and nuts. To market them in Japan, Japan's consumer agency issue a certificate based on the scientific evidence which you could obtain from your countries. Many EU confectionery companies obtain this certificate. The functional foods target at the consumers who attempt to maintain health by selecting higher nutritious product. Um, it should be noted that this organic and natural food are not so popular in Japan in comparison to European market. As for product categories, most important packaged food uh, in Japan are chilled processed food, such as chilled ready meals and chilled meat, bakery products, and dried uh, processed food, such as like uh, Italian risotto and pasta ready to eat. The last premium frozen food is also expanding. And they are sold uh, quite often under the private brands of uh, retail stores. 7-Eleven, for instance, has a range of its own frozen food brands. And E.ON is, um, is um, it's a big company associated with a French company called Picard. Uh, next topic is about distribution channels. Uh, first, I discuss uh, uh, about this, uh, business to uh, consumer transactions, B2C transactions. EU company can promote this, uh, EU premium food products to end customers through popular retail outlets, which are convenience stores, supermarkets, and the department stores. There are over 58,000 convenience stores covering throughout Japan both urban and rural areas, while they exist densely in urban cities. As you see on the screen, 7-Eleven has the highest market shares, followed by Lawson and the Family Mart. For Hokkaido, the northern island, Se Seiko Mart has exclusive market shares. There are over 22,000 supermarkets and over 200 department stores in Japan. Regional supermarkets and the department stores cater a range of products from basic groceries to electronics and cosmetics to clothing, and they feature one-stop convenience in a large scale. After recent consolidations, there are only two types of supermarkets. One type uh, continue catering a good quality food such as those owned by E.ON. E.ON is the largest retailer in Asia and Seven and I Holdings, which is the 15th largest retailer in the world. They target all segments, including senior market. The second type of supermarket is uh, those uh, who, uh, which sell discounted food products targeting young family and a single household, such as Don Quixote, it's a name of the um, supermarket, stores, owned by Pan Pacific International Holdings. In large cities like Tokyo and Osaka, there are supermarkets for premium imported food products. Online catalog sales are available for customers living in regional cities for order and instant delivery. I listed on the screen top 10 premium supermarkets for your information. Now I move to, uh, to the business to business transactions, B2B transactions. EU companies can promote EU products through Japanese specialized trading companies, trading companies specialized in food. Uh, top 10 large companies include Mitsubishi, Shokhin, Kato, Sangyo, Itochu, Shokhin, and so on. However, I listed on the screen 
uh, uh, medium-sized trading companies which specialize in food, which might be more uh, appropriate for the European uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, they deal in particular with the imported foods. I listed the nine uh, medium-sized uh, trading, specialized trading companies, uh, starting from Rakuto, uh, Japan, which is specialized in daily ingredients like a butter, cheese, skim milk, and powder. And it goes to Nichi, Nichimo and so on. We move to the next uh, slide, um, um, distribution channels. Um, for EU companies to meet these Japanese uh, distributors and retailer partners and then promote advertised EU product, uh, you could meet them at the two largest annual food trade shows, namely supermarket trade shows held in every February in Tokyo and Foodex Japan in every March. In addition, there are many more focus shows actively held in Japan, sector by sector, such as like a wine uh, show, uh, seafood, bakery, and then much more. For more information and a schedule, go to JETRO website. JETRO stands for Japan External Trade Organization. And the link is given on your screen. We move to the next uh, topic, um, engineering and then redesigning EU uh, food products. When marketing and selling in Japan, EU exporters and the Japanese distributors collaborate to engineer and redesign product by adapting a Japanese food culture. Two parties collaborated on one apportioning, two packaging and the wrapping, and three labels. As Japanese consumers buy smaller portion, distributors import food in bulk and reportion products locally. For Japanese consumers, packaging and the wrappings are very important part of products, and damaged packages and the wrapping are not accepted. So uh, distributor, Japanese distributors carefully repackage and rewrap re uh, in order to meet the local standard. Japanese distributors also re -rub, uh, label imported products to meet specific legal and administrative requirements, as well as to take advantage of, uh, of inserting nutrient function claims for marketing purposes. Uh, topic seven, challenges and opportunities for EU food products. Uh, generally speaking, entering a foreign market is a challenge and involves a substantial investment of time and money. It is even a bigger challenge for smaller sized companies. So it is very important for smaller businesses to do it right at the time of market entry and avoid repeating expensive failures. Smaller businesses which venture into Japan in particular must make product adaptations to Japanese market as a standard products brought from home uh, do not sell well in Japan. A key for success is a selection of good Japanese partners who would help you understand Japanese food culture, who would help you promote and brand products based on quality, who would be able to sell at the right distribution channels and at the right prices and who would help you maintain consumer trust and loyalty to your products. Topic eight, competition and collaborations. There are three types of competitions in Japan for EU products. 
One, competition from domestic products, Japanese products, which compete advantageously over foreign products. Two, competition from other exporting countries, which compete on level field, and a trade agreement similar to EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. Three, competition from other EU countries which compete under the same EU-Japan EPA. For each type of competition, EU producers and exporters carefully study competitors' uh, products and take a competitive position by adapting to the target uh, customer's needs and the preferences, but at the same time, by differentiating products from competitors' products and then discriminating prices. Alternative strategy is to replace competitions with collaborations. Uh, the members, your, uh, your uh, B, uh, B, uh, BNET, Building a European uh, Export Network. This is a very good opportunity for members uh, to collaborate, to sell a package of complementary products to Japanese distributors. I would give you a, a, a some uh, example on the screen. For instance, Japan has a seasonal gift market and distributors need to purchase a set of products as shown on the screen. It, there's a, a set of products. The market has a consumer segment and as well as a corporate segment. So not only the individual customers, but also the companies, they, give a, uh, they exchange gifts uh, mainly twice a year uh, in August and in December. To, uh, so uh, it is easier to collaborate with other European companies to make a set of products from Europe and they sell in the Japanese seasonal gift market. I have given on the screen how big the gift market is. It's a very stable market. I go to the last uh, slide. So references to the pre previous webinars. Uh, for more details on how to export your agri-food products to Japan, uh, please refer to my previous webinars on practical guide on export to sales process, procedures, and planning for EU agri-food products to Japan. Requirements for product lab uh, labels are, for instance, explained much more in detail on the slide. I, I'm sure the center can make these uh, slides available to, to you. Now, um, I would like to take uh, any question you may have, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Banesvig and Ms. Nakabayashi for your great explanation. I am sure that has been very useful for the entire participants in order to have a better understanding on how to develop their international actions uh, towards the agro-food sector in Japan and also about the IEPA. As Ms. Nakabayashi said just now, it's time to make your questions in the chat box so we can answer them. The first one is uh, from Ana Luisa Pais that asks if honey is under the EPA and therefore is it benefits from a duty free. I don't know if you can answer it, Mr. Banesvik. Uh, can you please repeat the question? I didn't hear it quite well, please. Yeah, don't worry. Ana Luisa Pais asks if honey is also under the EPA and therefore benefits from a duty free. Uh, honey and uh, as I can check, but as far as I know, uh, it is liberalized under the agree the duties are liberalized under the agreement over a period of seven years. Uh, the uh, base rate, uh, which was applied before the entering into force, was 25.7%. And that rate will be gradually 
phased out in seven years. So uh, after seven years, the duty will be zero. Okay. And also, uh, Mr. Banasvik, we have another question regarding Edmondo Angelazio as uh, he's interested to know a little bit about the rules of origin of uh, processed truffle products. The rules of origin of? Uh, truffle processed products. As he yes, but was... there um, uh, we have several positions uh, on uh, truffles. If it is the position, uh, the tariff code uh, what do I have here? 2003. Twenty o three. If it's that code for truffles, the market access, the duties, they are zero. But as far as rules of origin are concerned, and I'm looking in the product specific uh, rules table, all the products uh, of which the uh, code is between 2002 and 2003, so that should include the truffles. There, the rule is that in the production of the truffles, all the products coming from Chapter 7 should be wholly obtained. So all these Chapter 7 products should come from, should have, uh, should be, sorry, of EU or Japan origin. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Barasvik. Uh, someone has another question. If not, we will finish the webinar. I have seen that there was also a question on olive oil, no? Ah, uh, yes, olive oil. Yeah. Yes. Uh, was it on market access? Yes, I think it was on market access. For olive oil, uh, there, uh, it is classified under 1509 uh, heading, then olive oil is free. So the duties are free. I have it here. I have in front of me the uh, uh, screen of the customs uh, tariffs in Japan. Uh, olive oil and its fractions, whether or not refined, virgin and other, uh, for the EU, it's free. Yes, duty free. OK. Okay, I think that are all the questions solved right now. Okay, Edmondo Angelazio writes right now that, well, he has a lot of multiple questions as they are a truffle company working in luxury food market. They are interested to know mainly which is the category of truffle, mushroom, potato, etc. And also our core business is proceed products. So in the proceed products, we have different ingredients, actually from Italy. But what happens if we will begin to use EU products, example, EVO oil or honey or cheese, and in extreme case, are not EU products not forecasted by now? I think this question is a little bit related uh, about the rules of origin that yes. I asked before. Yes, I can. I can. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I do not know all these products by heart. But the thing is, if you are uh, producing a product using different materials, you have to look in the agreement in the product specific rules, and the product-specific rules, if you look at the agreement, it starts at page uh, 639 of the agreement. 
there, uh, of course, you have to know the code of your product. And then you look, uh, what is the rule for that code of product or product group? And if you use materials uh, imported outside the EU and Japan, you have to be careful because you have to look whether you can use these materials in the production of your products, yes or no, or to what level. Uh, sometimes you can use a product out, imported from outside the EU or Japan. You can use such a material imported outside the EU or Japan up to a certain degree or yes or no, or with, with uh, limitations or without limitations, or not at all, you know. Uh, you have to read carefully the product-specific rules. If uh, you do that, and of course you have, uh, it is so that if you have further questions or you don't understand something, then address your question to the EU Japan Center who will forward it to me and I will try to reply to it, okay? Thank you very much, Mr. Van Uh Okay, I think it's time to finish this webinar. So thank you very much to all the participants and also the DU Japan Center to be, to be with us today. And also I would like to, uh, so yeah, and also I would like to remind that the next 26th of February, we will have a new webinar regarding this time the e-commerce in China. So if you are interested, just enter to the BNET website to have all the information and the links. If you have any questions regarding the next webinar, feel free to send your comments and apps to the contact details that you can see in the screen. Also, regarding uh, all this webinar, take into account that will be uploaded uh, in no time on our YouTube channel, so stay tuned if you want to review it. As a conclusion, have a very nice day 